Welcome along to today's edition of the show. Uh, if you're new here on YouTube, then do make sure to like today's video, subscribe to the channel, and you can get more from Unbelievable, including our regular newsletter. The info is with today's show. Today, we're asking, should people of faith support assisted dying? Now, the House of Lords will be debating a new bill on assisted dying this coming month. Baroness Meacher's bill is reigniting the question of whether people with terminal illness should be allowed to end their own life with the help of medical professionals. Now, the bill would introduce similar legislation to that of Oregon in the USA, where assisted dying and euthanasia has been legal for some time. Uh, the British Medical Association recently officially dropped its opposition to assisted dying. And according to a recent poll, three quarters of the British public back changes. However, a smaller proportion of MPs are convinced. But what about the religious and ethical questions that arise when it comes to euthanasia and the choice to end a life. Well, joining me on today's show are Rabbi Jonathan Romain. He chairs the Religious Alliance for Dignity in Dying and advocates for changing the law to allow people to end their lives under the right circumstances. Dr. Mark Pickering is chair of the Christian Medical Fellowship. That's an organisation which currently opposes the assisted dying bill. Um, and Mark believes it's ethically wrong for medical staff to participate in deliberately ending life. And that the Bible's view of the sanctity of life means that Christians and people of faith generally should stand against it. So we're going to be hearing from both Mark and Jonathan in the course of today's show. Uh, this is very much a, a current trending topic at the moment. Um, and perhaps we'll start with you, Jonathan, uh, just to give a sense of, of how you've been involved up to this point in these issues and, and what your role with Dignity in Dying is when it comes to this particular bill. Well, I started off um, against assisted dying uh, for all the sort of usual reasons, so to speak, uh, that uh, people of faith in the past, uh, I suggest I stress in the past because it has changed enormously. But my, my views began to change because the more time I spent in hospital, hospitals and hospices, yes, of course, they do wonderful work. I mean, there's no doubt about it. They're just fabulous heroes, the people who, who are there especially the hospices, but there are some people who they cannot help, they cannot reach, and there are also some people who are not so much dying in pain, but dying in great distress or indignity because of the nature of the illness they've got. And I just thought, this can't be right, and, and, and you know, time after time people would say to me, oh, I just wish I would die, or every time I wake up in the morning, I, I'm so disappointed I'm still alive. And I thought, in those cases, and those particular cases, why cannot somebody who is already dying, terminally ill, uh, be allowed uh, to gently let go and say to God, thank you very much, it's been a great life so far, but I really don't want to endure the last few weeks. So I got involved in Dignity in Dying and actually became a board member and then I'm now vice chair. And as part of that, I also founded the Religious Alliance for Dignity in Dying, which links together people of faith. And that's both at the sort of uh, clergy level. So we've got rabbis, priests, vicars, imams. So in other words, it covers all faiths, but also very much um, laity, again, of all faiths. Uh, just to say that you can have faith and be in favour of assisted dying in a very particular circumstances, which is the threefold formula of being terminally ill, mentally competent, and, and actually wishing it for yourself. And, and that's mm. where uh, I am now. And uh, we feel we've got, you know, there are arguments against, and I'm sure Mark will give them, but there are many religious arguments for. Right. Whereas beforehand, I think people thought it was thou shalt not, and it was a blanket no from the religious. Uh, now I think it's accepted there's a diversity of views within the faith community. I, I mentioned the the British public, the poll at least, that was commissioned suggested about three quarters are in favour of the law changing. How does that map out as far as you can see when it comes to people of faith and particularly clergy, whether they be Jewish, Christian or something else? Um, what what? How do you see the, the general you know recognition of this and thoughts changing? Well, I have to say I've been bowled over by the, the, the polls. Um, you know, I expected it to be a sort of 50-50 split, but the, the last poll that was taken, I think it was Populous uh, in 2020, um, showed 84% of the public were in favour. So, you know, astonishingly high. I mean, in political terms, that would be an absolute, it wouldn't be a, a landslide, it would be a sort of volcano. Um, but what was really fascinating is the religious element. And they, they broke it down and they found that actually 82% of people of faith 
were in favour. And how do you define people of faith? Well, it's not just people who sort of got an airy fairy belief in God, but these are people who go to their place of worship, church or whatever, at least once a month, if not more. So 82% of people of faith really, and what astonished me about that was not only how high that was, but it was in contrast to the sort of position of the hierarchy, like, you know, the Archbishop of Canterbury or the Catholic um, Bishop of Westminster, and how, um, although the hierarchy says absolutely no, uh, the membership, the faith-based membership, has a very different view. Yes, and it's interesting because I, I suspect there's a similar split between MPs and their willingness to to change the law and what appears to be the, you know, what the polls suggest about the British public. But we'll, we'll come back to that. And, and I suppose there is that question of, should we just go with the majority thought on these sorts of issues? But Mark, um, let's introduce you first of all. Tell us a little bit about your role, first of all, with Christian Medical Fellowship and, and how they've been responding to uh, this proposed bill and indeed what the British Medical Association have recently decided on it. Great. Thanks, Justin. Pleasure to be here. T- today it's like playing for my favourite football team because I've been um, <laughs> an avid, unbelievable listener for about three years. It was one of the first podcasts I ever um, managed to listen to and oh, it's still you. my favourite so it's great to be here. Oh, oh brownie points um, so for you I'm for the... mentioning that. <laughs> so yeah I'm the chief executive of the Christian Medical Fellowship. We're an organisation of doctors, nurses, midwives and students um, over four and a half thousand within the UK and Ireland and I've been involved with them since I was a student for more than 25 years but I've been their chief executive for the last two and a half years. And our job is uh, uh, what we, t- we call it, uniting and equipping Christian doctors and nurses to live and speak for Jesus. And so it's basically helping them to integrate their faith with their medical nursing and midwifery practice or their studies. So part of that is member support with the different areas that we do, you know, conferences and that sort of thing, literature. But it's also helping to educate them, to think through the issues that they deal with, and also to uh, to engage with and protect the environment in which they work, both for Christian clinicians, but also for vulnerable populations. So that's why we do quite a bit of public policy as well. So we're often engaged in uh, debates such as these. And uh, we work with a number of partner organisations, like the Care Not Killing Alliance, and their new medical wing called Our Duty of Care. There's also a new all-party parliamentary group on Dying Well, and a number of us work together in different ways. So the the debates over assisted suicide uh, and euthanasia are not new. You know they've been debated many times. I think it's more than fifteen times in UK parliaments. So the fact that Baroness Meacher's bill is coming back this year is nothing new. Uh, proponents will often say, "Oh, it's never been debated properly. We haven't heard the arguments." That's just not true. They've been done to death, as you might say. Um, but it's one of those things where people will feel they haven't been heard because they haven't changed the law yet. And that's why things keep coming back Mm. in the same fashion, whether it was Lord Joffe's bill or Lord Falconer's bill or the the Maris bill in 2015, which was defeated very heavily. Uh, And I think in terms of CMF's involvement, I think many of the the arguments against assisted suicide and euthanasia, they work almost equally well if you're religious or not religious. We'll obviously come on to some of those as well, but I think there are particular reasons why people of faith, certainly people who engage with their faith, are more likely to oppose assisted suicide and euthanasia as well. And then I think very often the polling that you hear about is, is it's, it's often very vague. You know, people are asked sort of sugary questions about choice and control and, and compassion. And so most people think, yes, of course, of course I support choice and control and compassion and dignity at the end of life. But it's when you get down to the brass tacks of what that actually means, people start to think, oh, there are actually problems in that. And they're the things that it'd be great to talk about today, obviously. What what do you make and what has Christian Medical Fellowship made of this recent, um, I think, I don't know if it's the first time really, but but the, the British Medical Association have officially dropped their opposition to assisted dying. Yeah, and, and, and the way that you've phrased that is exactly what the headlines have said. You know, doctors drop opposition to assisted dying. It sounds like it was really emphatic, whereas actually it wasn't. There were 302 people debating, 149 voted 
for neutrality, 145 voted against. There were eight abstentions, so it's 49 to 48% split. And actually, a majority of those in the room did not even support that vote. So it was very, very, very close. And it was based upon the um, it was based upon the poll that the BMA did back in February 2020. 29,000 member uh, responses. It's a really excellent poll and very good data to have. And you know, all credit to, to DID and to Jonathan and his team. Uh, they did come out on top of that with 40% 40, 40 of the respondents from that BMA survey saying that they were in favour of law change and 33% against. So there clearly is a split amongst the medical profession. But what you often don't see from that data is that that data was skewed significantly by students um, who voted more for assisted suicide those who've never looked after patients, then retired doctors who will never again look after patients. And that was the sort of thing you see through that. Whereas the people who deal day in, day out with um, end of life conversations, palliative care physicians, very strongly opposed, GPs, oncologists, geriatricians, they're much more likely to be opposed. Mm. So as, um, as in many situations, there is a split, but the closer you get to death and working with death, and the concept of assisted suicide and euthanasia, the more you tend to recoil from it. And that's something that you really don't see um, in the headlines. Yeah. I'd be interested in your response to that, Jonathan, but also perhaps just to bring us up to speed with Baroness Meacher's bill. I mean, Mark says these issues have been done to death. Um, at, we've had Lord Falconer's bill and others in you know relatively recent past. What is there anything new about this bill, or is it just putting it on the table again in in a very similar fashion to before, Jonathan? Uh, well, two comments. Uh, in one respect, um, um, Mark's right. In one respect, he's wrong. I mean, to be honest, Mark, you began to sound a little bit like Donald Trump saying, well, I did win the election after all. Um, and, and actually, he didn't. He lost the election. And similarly, the BMA, I mean, you know, yes, you're right. The vote itself was uh, very close on the day, but they were representative and they, and they were basing their vote on the survey, which, as you said, was massive. But every single doctor in the country had the ability to participate and the, and the majority but, and it was quite a clear majority voted either uh, for neutrality or in favour. So, um, you know, you can fiddle a little bit with the figures, but there's no doubt that there's something significant going on within the medical profession, because uh, if, as you say, there was such concern, then the, those in, uh, in favour of either changing the law or, or the BMA being neutral would never have got anywhere near um, the vote that they achieved. So I think you have to say there is a shift amongst the doctors, uh, whether one likes it or not. But you are right in saying, yes, we've debated this before. And, um, yep, you, you named all the main bills, Joffe bill, Faulkner bill, and now the current Meacher bill. Um, and uh, the, the only thing that's a little bit different is that they've tightened it up. Because when the Joffe bill came along, it was a little bit vague. And people were, I think, rightly worried about the safeguards. Because, you know, there's always the case of oh, vulnerable individuals. And so the, in every single bill, the safeguards have been made stronger and stronger. So, for instance, in the, in the uh, Faulkner bill, uh, the person had to be interviewed by two independent doctors separately um, uh, just to check that they really did want it. Uh, now, in the uh, Meacher bill, uh, it has to have a judicial oversight. So um, you can't just get a friendly doctor. The whole process has to be overseen uh, by the courts and by the judge to really ensure uh, that all the boxes have been ticked and that the safeguards are really robust. So uh, there are slight changes, but yes, the substantial issue, does someone have the right uh, to bring their own life to an end um, if they are dying in pain? The, the arguments for or against are probably still the same. And Mark, I'm sure you can understand why there would be people in favour of this change. Um, it's always distressing to see a loved one and indeed for anyone themselves to go through that kind of uh, an experience but why why historically and in your view you know do most working professionals in this area still oppose actually people being able to do that well i think it's because like i said with those uh, those polls of public opinion they're very strongly in favor when you talk in vague terms and you talk in a sort of utopian idea of how it will all work when you know, if it goes as as Jonathan hopes it would go. But whenever you start to talk about the problems, you start to talk about some of the, the challenges 
talk about some of the evidence of how it's really gone in other countries, then that support often does tend to fall away a little bit. I mean, Jonathan didn't mention actually that there's been a 10% drop in public's opinion, public opinion. That 2021 survey showed, I think, 73%, whereas normally it's quoted, as you did, Jonathan, in 2020 as 80 odd percent. So we don't hear people talking about that drop in that. But I think it's, um, you know, the, the classic arguments against are that this is basically an autonomy driven exercise. It is people saying, you know, I want that choice. I want that control. And of course, we understand that, you know, people don't like to uh, to have pain. But as Jonathan said, that's not the majority of people. You know, we often hear people talking about dying in terrible pain. But thanks to the hospice movement, very few people in in an advanced healthcare system die in significant pain. There are a few, but it's a few. And the vast majority is about things like autonomy. In, in in Oregon in 2020, I think it was 59% of the people who opted for an assisted suicide, they said they felt a burden to either themselves or to their, their family and carers. And a lot of that is, is really driving the concern that we have that the autonomy of a few uh, will lead to the erosion of autonomy and, and the burden and the actual duty to die for those who are vulnerable. And then we've seen in many other places the the um, laws extend. So uh, Jonathan and DID will often talk about how or in Oregon things haven't changed significantly. That's true. Federal law in the US prevents them going for euthanasia, so that's not because uh, Oregon is anything special. But whereas in Canada you've seen a massive erosion of the safeguards in just five years, we talk about terminal illness, and that was part of the original Canadian provision but it's been struck down in actually three years, from 2016 to 2019. Uh, now that, that terminal illness provision has been struck down. So any disabled or chronically ill person in Canada can and often does opt for what they euphemistically call medical aid in dying. So there's no, there's absolutely no, um, uh, there's no um, assurance that the UK won't go that far. In fact, um, Dignity and Dying are just one of six organisations in the UK and the Crown Dependencies that are all campaigning for some form of assisted dying. And all of the others go significantly beyond Dignity and Dying. You know, the terminal illness is a purely arbitrary um, question. And you know, people like Paul Lamb, who was a very high profile campaigner, he was in pain for 30 years after a road traffic accident. He wanted to have an assisted suicide. Dignity in Dying did not support him. He would not have been eligible through the Meacher Bill. And, and we would often want to say, well, to Jonathan, you, where is your compassion for people like Paul Lamb, who had the same desires, but you would not put them in with your bill? And why not? Yeah, feel free to answer that, Jonathan. And I suppose that there are those who see this as a sort of slippery slope, thin end of the wedge and so on. Uh, and those who are concerned about places like um, the Netherlands, where there are there appear to be cases of people effectively being euthanized almost because they just feel deeply depressed and, and that sort of thing. And is there any particular reason why we should stop at terminal illness rather than other reasons people may want to end their life? Uh, sure. And I mean, you're right to quote um, the Netherlands, but you're wrong to sort of uh, compare it to what we're proposing here in England. It's a totally different system. They started off in a different position, different rules. It's like comparing football and rugby. You know, there they had a much broader uh, definition right from the word go. Whereas dignity and dying has always been adamant. You have to be tonally ill. So you're not depressed. You're not going through a bad patch. Uh, you're not chronically ill. And yes, you're right. Um, it's very sad when you've got someone who is chronically ill, like Paul Lamb, and they've got sort of a long, uh, difficult period ahead of them. But we're talking about law rather than feeling. So law has to be um, needs clear definitions so that uh, judges can say, well, this um, uh, coincides with the uh, uh, the law and this does not, and it falls outside its parameters. And and that's why um, dignity in dying goes for someone who is terminally ill, as specified by the doctors, as opposed to being in long term pain, because um, that is something that can be uh, legislated upon whereas uh, the others um, cannot be. Well, could I just ask back to that, Jonathan? So if you get your way in the Meech Bill passes and then My Death, My Decision, Humanist UK, the other uh, campaign groups say, well, that's a good first step, but now we want to push on for 
you know, people like Paul Lamb and others who are still in pain, you know, their autonomy demands this, our compassion demands this. Will you actively be campaigning against those bills? Will you be saying, no, we, we have sympathy, but we're not going to campaign for you? Because like you said, it's about law. It's not about feelings. That's what we've always been saying. And you've always been painting us as the uncompassionate ones. But when you're in that position, how will you respond? Uh, well, uh, I will drop out of the debate at that point because I don't think that's viable. Um, and it Do you mean you'll totally... step back and, and let your friends push it on from where you've got it started? Um, because I don't think, uh, unless you're prepared to speak against them, it really does, you know, it really does give the lie to the position that you're holding now. Okay, well, I won't lie then. I, I will, I will if, if I'm asked, and I'm very happy to come back and just this program, if, 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 if the bill does go through and becomes law, and say, well, I'm very pleased that we've got the current law, turn the ill, mentally competent, um, but I don't want it to go any further. And so if I'm asked, I will say I'm, I'm against the law. And by the way, of course, it... It, the, the law won't change, and if it does, it would only be because three or four hundred part, uh, MPs uh, decide that it should. Um, so I find that pretty inconceivable, to be honest. I, I mean, great question back to you. Why should that be inconceivable when it's happened in Canada in just three years after the law came into operation? What's so special about the UK? And you know, we talk about public opinion, which you do um, put a lot of store by. But whenever you hear your phone-in programs after there's been a debate about it, you, you, you'll often have a, a patient coming on talking about how difficult their end-of-life situation is or a relative. Very often they're people with Alzheimer's, they're people with chronic disability, or uh, somebody phoned in straight after a discussion recently and they said, oh, well, you know, if I get to that point when I'm just staring at four walls and I can't wipe my own backside, you know, I want to have assisted suicide. But of course, none of these would be um, helped by your law. And so you've got this massive tide of public opinion that doesn't understand that what you're proposing does not go far enough. In my death, my decision, they are the people who came out of dignity and dying because you don't go far enough. Exactly. And exactly. In other words, they were not satisfied with the, with the limited stand we took and they broke away. And we didn't say to them, oh, well, don't worry, stay with us, uh, we'll do a first step and then we'll move on to you. We said, I'm sorry, you cannot be part of our organisation because this simply isn't what we're aiming for. Because you understand that it does not go well with the public and with Parliament. You, you, you don't want this either. So we're on the same side here. Um, but have you ever put that to MPs? You know, Do MPs understand and do the, the peers in the House of Lords that you've been lobbying, do they, do they understand just how much the public opinion is actually for going further than what you're campaigning for. I'm not sure that's correct, by the way, that the public opinion wants to go further. And certainly MPs are very well aware of it. And if this bill passes, it'll only be because MPs will feel reassured that there is a red line. And that's the whole point, that, that there is a sort of a, an end uh, that can, is measurable. And we can say to someone, <coughs> well, yes, it's very sad that you're going to live on in pain for 20 years. Um, and we're going to do everything compassionate to try and help you, uh, but you are not eligible for assisted dying because that's just not part of the, the act, and the, and the law is the law. And, and You're almost sounding like me and my colleagues, Jonathan, but you've always said that we're terribly uncompassionate for saying exactly those same things. I'm not saying you're uncompassionate, I'm saying that a more compassionate response is to help people who are terminally ill and dying anyway. So, uh, And I think that's what's so crucial about this debate, by the way, and, and where it differs, and this is where perhaps many of the other people, maybe not yourself, uh, in the religious community who do oppose assisted dying, is that they, they, they maybe get a little bit um, confused or uh, bemused or befuddled uh, by the comparisons with a suicide. And, and the, the crucial difference is that for most people who commit suicide, had they not done so, they would have lived on for maybe 10, 20, 30, 40 years. With assisted dying, um, they are dying anyway. Um, so that's a very, very different scenario. They are dying anyway. Uh, it's just that they want to let go a few weeks earlier. Can, can I can I sort of get then on the record in a sense then, Jonathan, but you are saying that it is unethical and potentially, you know, not something that any religious person should support to enable someone who wants to die for any other purpose to, to take that decision. That, that should not be left Correct. in their Correct. own hands. Yeah, very, um, very I, clear red line. OK, this is very helpful to me because I think a lot of people do conflate 
all of these issues and they you know and, and as, as mark says a lot of people i think just think of dignity and dying as being i want autonomy about when i end my life where i end my life you know in whatever circumstances i choose and obviously that's not where the organization is coming you're, you're worried though mark that actually this is simply the first staging post in something a lot more liberal uh, in the direction that canada has gone and, and elsewhere um i do want to to kind of draw us into this sort of the, the some the, the specifically religious issue of of this of course um and mark perhaps just before we go to our first break you could explain why you know even at, even at the level of simply assisting people who are already terminally ill to die you believe that even that level of assistance actually uh, you know, your Christian faith doesn't allow you to, to participate in that. Well, I think you know, this idea that all religious people oppose assisted dying, we've never said that. That is a myth that's been perpetuated by Dignity in Dying and, and their colleagues, because for years, whenever people have spoken out against you know, physician-assisted dying and assisted suicide, often they are religious people, and, and that's been a, a means to dismiss them, to say, oh, you're religious, we're not, we don't have to listen to you. So that's a myth that's been perpetuated. And now, suddenly, um, Jonathan and, and his friends have come along and you know, suddenly discovered, in quotes, that there are religious people who actually do support them. And now we, we have, you know, say, oh, yeah, we've discovered it's not all, all people or religious people. Of course it's not. Um, but I think what we do find is that those people who engage seriously with their faith are less likely to support assisted suicide. Now, you know, Jonathan has, has talked about his new religious alliance for dignity in dying. It's not really new. It's an old recycled alliance for, for um, religious people. It used to be called Interfaith Leaders for Dignity in Dying. And a couple of years ago, I was looking around to say, well, they must be active. I'd like to engage with them. And there was nothing. You know, a couple of out-of-date website pages. It had basically fallen away because it's the same four people, Jonathan, uh, Rosie Harper, uh, George Carey, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, and Desmond Tutu from South Africa. And they're the only four figureheads really there. And there are so few leaders, uh, mainstream leaders. There are a few people more on the fringe and, and more towards the, the liberal end of, of different faiths. You know, that there's, there's an imam who supports same-sex marriage. You know, that's not exactly mainstream Islam. Um, and that we, we find this... I think in all of the things that I've seen so far, these religious people who support assisted uh, suicide, it's generally um, sort of using the same secular arguments about autonomy and compassion and saying, oh, well, surely God likes that. Um, but actually, it's not seriously engaging with faith and the arguments from faith, because I think there are probably three main arguments uh, that we could use that are consistent with with the, the mainstream faiths and that also overlap with some of the main arguments against assisted suicide and I'm, I'm sure Jonathan would like to come back in a bit a, a bit on what I've just said but then hopefully we can look at some of those three main arguments. We'll go to a quick break and I'll allow Jonathan to do that in just a moment's time. Um, we're talking about assisted dying and and we'll, we'll, we're joined today by Jonathan Romain, a rabbi, Mark Pickering, who is chair of the Christian Medical Fellowship. And we'll continue to discuss the ins and outs of this uh, new bill proposed by Baroness Meacher on assisted dying here on Unbelievable. For more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter. Welcome back to the second part of this week's edition of the show. We're talking about whether people of faith should support assisted dying on Unbelievable today. The House of Lords due to debate, uh, again, I think it's the uh, second reading uh, of the um, assisted dying bill from Baroness Meacher. And um, one person very much in favour of this is Rabbi Jonathan Romain. He chairs the Religious Alliance for Dignity in Dying. I'll make sure there's a link to them from today's show. He believes there are circumstances under which people with terminal illness should be allowed to end their lives. Dr. Mark Pickering from Christian Medical Fellowship is speaking against this proposed change. Um, and just in that last section, we were starting to dig into the reasons why Mark believes as a Christian um, we shouldn't be supporting these kinds of changes. He doesn't think that that the 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 religious alliance is really as strong as as perhaps people make out. Jonathan, it's the same figureheads as have been you know put put forward in the past on these issues. Um, what what's your view on this in terms of the the actual religious case, if you like, for for um, this kind of assisted dying? Well, I was a bit amused about Mark's answer because instead of giving you a positive reason 
why Christians are against assisted dying. He just talked about the numbers of uh, those in favour. And I'm also a bit bemused uh, that he considers people like the former Archbishop of Canterbury and, and Desmond Tutu as not, quote, seriously engaging in their faith. But, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't want to have a sort of ding-dong about um, a, a religious warfare. You know, there are good arguments on both sides. I just feel that from a religious perspective, um, if somebody is dying already and they request to let go of life early, in whose interest are we keeping them alive? For what benefit are we forcing them to suffer on? And, you know, there's nothing sacred about suffering. There's nothing holy about agony. And, and, and I just simply don't understand um, uh, why, if someone wants it, they shouldn't be allowed it. Now, I get entirely that, that Mark and many people like him wouldn't want it. Fair enough, great, and let's hope you live a long and healthy life. But I think it's almost a bit arrogant to say somebody else has to suffer on in pain uh, because of, you know, your principles. Um, it's their life. It's their death. We all hope for a good life and a good death. And why are we stopping them having it? it? To me, that's just sort of so obviously the humane, the moral, the ethical, the religious response. As as a rabbi, then Jonathan, just to be really clear on this, you you don't feel that there's a sort of um, anything wrong with humans stepping in, intervening to bring an early death to someone that that doesn't transgress any sort of particular teaching uh, from Judaism about the sanctity of life and and that those sorts of decisions are ultimately in, in God's hands rather than in, in ours? Um, well, uh, number one, of course, uh, assisted dying is nowhere mentioned um, in the Bible. Uh, it's a very much a modern issue, so it's not really part of biblical or later teachings. And number two, there are suicides in the Bible, and nowhere, um, there are four suicides, in fact, and nowhere does the Bible actually condemn them. So, you know, things have moved, have changed enormously in that respect as well. Um, and you know, not, and there is division amongst rabbis. So, um, um, so the answer is no. There is there is there is no inherent problem uh, with someone who, is, as I say, if they fit this particular category, terminally ill, mentally competent, wanted of their own free will, um, there doesn't seem to be any particular objection. And of course, the God barrier, uh, is, you know, only this is only in the hands of God. We, we, we transgress that every single day in all sorts of birth and death, don't we? You know, we bring into life test tube babies who, if God had his way, would never be born. Uh, uh, we see someone with a heart attack um, and don't let them die, um, you know, facing God's way, so to speak. We give them a tra heart transplant or a blood transfusion. So we're constantly interfering, if you like, uh, and uh, in, in, in both the end and the beginning of life. We're playing God. And I don't say that in a, in a negative way. Um, you know, we are using our God-given talents to help people and benefit people. And this is another example of where we can help someone in pain. E even if it's actually in the, the actual outcome of that is the person losing their life before they they would have you know naturally died a death themselves but but i understand the principle you're saying whether yeah. it's helping someone to yeah. live further or or ending their life earlier it's it's about the princ principle of I, I suppose compassion and doing doing what is right as as far as you can see and by the way um mark will know about more than this more than me but if you are a strong christian and you believe in the afterlife um well you just get to see god earlier don't you Okay. Well, Mark, let's pass it over to you. You, you do indeed, uh, but your uh, going passing from death to life is a pathway to judgment and then to you know either reward or punishment. As as you know, the uh, the Old Testament scriptures are very clear. Daniel twelve, verse two, and also the New Testament scriptures as well. So I think uh, yes, for for Christians or for for someone who is uh, engaged with their faith, then the approach of death need not have fear in it. Um, it can be actually the gateway to, um, you know, to to something they're looking forward to. But the vast majority of people that you're supporting this for, they're not engaged Christians. They're not observant Jews. Very many, very many of the times, they're they're, you know, agnostics and atheists and that sort of thing. And so we can't really as people of faith say to them oh sure this is okay it's all right for me you know i'm going to put this law in place because i think i'm all right but actually i've got no assurance about you now wh what i heard from you jonathan was really no religious case at all just a, a bit of a sort of fumbling around saying well you know rabbis are divided that I, I don't see anything definitely against it in the bible 
you talked about four suicides. Yes, there are four suicides, and there's no, you know, teaching that says, you know, thou shalt not commit suicide, etc., etc. But you look at those suicides, like King Saul. None of these are are things that are looked up to in the Bible as a great and glorious death. It's not like the noble suicide of Greek philosophy. You know, Saul was slain on the battlefield and you know, apparently had to get an Amalekite soldier to finish him off because he was in pain at the time. You know, that's just like the, the ignominious end to um, a life lived in opposition to God. So nowhere is it, is it actually promoted. But I said that I'll, I'll make three main arguments from a faith perspective that chime with the secular arguments. And, and the first one is that overemphasizing autonomy for a few will lead to increased vulnerability for the people with the least autonomy. Now, God has given us rationality and autonomy, and a reasonable degree of that is really good. But whenever we're demanding our rights, then that leads to duties on others, and that very much affects the vulnerable. Now, of course, you know, Jews and Christians hearing me, they'll think, well, what's he talking about? He's talking about sin. You know, when we push our autonomy to you know, going beyond the boundaries that God has set or going beyond what's good for other people and for society, that is sinfulness. Um, non-religious people might know it as human nature, you know, the fact that we all tend to be selfish and, and look out for number one. But that's one reason why I think Christians and Jews and most people of faith should be really, really careful and really, really suspicious of these great claims that, you know, it's all about autonomy. Autonomy is the driver. No, we're actually very suspicious about unbridled, unrestrained autonomy. And that's a secular argument that chimes with a faith argument. Secondly, about safeguards. Um, you know, Jonathan again puts this utopian vision with these lovely rose-tinted glasses of how wonderful it is in Oregon, where everything works smoothly, the laws don't extend, society does not become less compassionate as we get used to killing people, suicide doesn't become normalized. But again, we know as people of faith that that never ever works. Um, I think it was Francis Spufford that said about about humanity's propensity to <clears throat> mess things up. And, um, you know, again, we, we use that, we know that as sin or human nature, but everything always goes wrong. You know, most, I mean, communism, socialism, they're, they're great ideas on paper, but once you get real people involved in them, they fall apart. And exactly this is what we see with uh, assisted suicide. You know, we know as people of faith that the safeguards we put in place very soon, you know, people will push against them. Safeguards will become barriers to access. We've seen that in many, in many jurisdictions. Now people are saying, oh, this is a barrier to patient access, something that was put in as a safeguard. That's the second thing. Um, and then again, suffering, the third one, suffering is not just hopeless. You, you never see in dignity and dying's material, anything good that could possibly come out of suffering. Um, you know, Jonathan says that about the that you know, what is it? Suffering. Is, there's no sanctity in suffering. Um, well, actually, there can be great purpose in suffering. You know, all the best literature, poetry, uh, philosophy, and of course, so many things in faith. They come out of a place of suffering. That's where we often learn. It's where we often uh, reflect on our life, on the life of those people around us. The example that we give of fortitude in suffering, dignity by the way that we deal with suffering, that can have a brilliant effect on the people around us. So who is it for? Well, it's, it's for all of us. Because in the times I've worked in hospices, you see people coming in hopeless, uncontrolled symptoms. Oh, doctor, let me die all understanding but when you actually get on top of those things when you help them to see that it's not as hopeless as that you know uh, family relationships can be restored many good things can happen at the end of life my big worry is that for the people who've always been in control who want to you know take their own life and push their own autonomy they'll put in place a legal framework which a will enable them to avoid talking about those things but it will actually make the, the people who are vulnerable be a burden and request those things when actually they wouldn't do that. Thank you so much. There's three three things to respond there to Jonathan, and maybe we'll just take them in order, and, and we can sort of spend some time going going through each one. Why not? Why what about that first one, um, which, which is effectively Mark relates to the problem of sin um, that we overemphasize people's autonomy, um, that that leads to a, a pressure on the vulnerable, um, and there's there's a sinful aspect of this 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 idea that we are we all have to be you know 
decide for ourselves everything around us and that we therefore fail to see the effects that that has on other people. Your thoughts on that point? Uh, yes, and that's true in many situations, but not in all situations. Um, and there are times when we do want and, and, and vary, value and, and cherish autonomy, uh, which is why we are created in the image of God and we've got that creative spark and we can do things uh, that other people cannot do. And um, we're not automatons or robots. Uh, and um, uh, certainly one's own autonomy shouldn't impact on others. Um, uh, you know, the old you're not allowed to shout fire in a crowded cinema, that sort of thing. Um, but when your autonomy is affecting, is affecting you, and you're the one dying in pain, I think you do have the right to say, I've had enough, I can't go on, I would like to pass away, I would like to get a life-ending prescription from my doctor. I think you do have the autonomy. So we'll just have to disagree on that one. And as for the safeguards, well, okay, um, it's, a, it's a valid point, you want to make sure that the law works and, and doesn't um, affect anyone negatively. So the answer then is to work with uh, Molly Meacher or, or, or any other bill and, and say, well, these are the safeguards that we need to put in place. Uh, this is what we need to do to make it as watertight as possible uh, so that we can not necessarily want that option for ourselves, but we can um, know that if that option is taken up by other people, it is done in the safest possible way. And as for suffering, well, I guess you know, um, straight disagree with you there. I, I, yes, of course, suffering can lead to great poetry and, and, and all the rest of it, or um, even discoveries. But uh, actually, for most people, suffering is pretty horrible. And um, again, if you want suffering, fine. But if someone says, no, thank you, I do not want to suffer, and particularly as I've only got a few weeks left, and particularly as, you know, I, I can't move my limbs or my brain is befuddled, um, I, I'm not really going to write War and Peace in the next few weeks, uh, then I don't see why we should insist that they suffer. I, I just don't get it. I, I, I'm interested then, before Mark comes back, Jonathan, and as to why you don't support those who are simply suffering but without necessarily a terminal illness in view, why you don't support their death as well. They're, they're, will, you know, if they could end their suffering, why not in their case? Purely for the very practical reason that it would be so hard to measure and that's exactly when the vulnerable or abuses could creep in. And it's precisely because I want to make sure that there are safeguards and protect the vulnerable that you, you can only do it by having a very, very clear line in the sand. And, and the law anyway demands that because uh, the, the law can't fudge. It has to have a very clear okay. um, cliff edge where it, where it does apply to certain yeah. people and circumstances and not to others. So, so to some extent, it's a it's a practical argument that you simply can't can't yeah legislate for as easily, obviously, in that that scenario. But yeah, responses on all three of those there, then Mark, that that uh, you know, yeah, yes, we should be careful, but actually, that autonomy is good in certain circumstances and. It, Jonathan simply can't see any reason why you, you wouldn't grant that kind of autonomy as long as it doesn't impact other people. Yeah, and I think we're seeing just where the reasoning is all falling apart here because, you know, a clear line. What's clear about six months? What about those with nine months or 12 months? Those with motor neurone disease who they know they're going to die. They don't want to suffer, you know, down to that last six months. What about the two or three years that gets them there? There's 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 nothing that that means six months is magic period prognosis from doctors is is often way out people that we thought would die in six months can be alive sometimes five years later and you've said that suffering is hard to measure i would agree suffering is totally subjective but because you're pushing this narrative of fear and hopelessness then rather than i mean you know as a rabbi if i came to you you know suffering in some way psychologically you know, would you say, yeah, it's tough, maybe you should kill yourself? You know, of course you wouldn't say that. You'd say, well, let's see if we can see it differently. You know, let me tell you a story. You know, let me, let's see what we can do. Can we, put, can we put something in place to help and support you better? Um, you've said that our own autonomy shouldn't impact others. That is absolutely true. And we're simply making the case, as we've often made, that pushing autonomy for a small number generally of people who are determined, the people that we see about in the news who go to Dignitas or campaign for you, that will change the law 
but it will affect everyone. It's going to impact everyone so that every GP, every NHS hospice doctor would then have to say, you know, here are the options before you and have you thought about assisted suicide? doesn't matter if you've never thought about it before. I'm duty bound to raise this with you because it's available on the NHS. And then there are people who live their whole lives in unrelievable suffering. You know, there are people with severe personality disorders, some of whom I look after. I don't understand why you're fighting this when you don't want to give them the right anyway. So why are you criticising me for giving them uh, that help when you don't want to do it either? What a great question, Jonathan. It's because I know that we need to have compassion for people in suffering. These people with personality disorders who feel a chronic sense of emptiness, suicidal thoughts day after day, we don't say to them, yeah, your life really sucks, there's not much we can do, we should help you to kill yourself. And because we can show compassion to them, then we can show compassion to people with chronic illness, disability, terminal illness. That is what the hospice movement does. Now, Jonathan, you often tell the story of, of what changed your mind. The person in the hospice who was doubled up in pain and, you know, nothing could be done for them. And you say that that, that was one of the stories that changed your mind. And I, I'd be interested to know, what did you do at that point? Did you call for a nurse? Did you find out if a doctor had you know, prescribed the right medication? Had they been referred to palliative care? Or did you just think, there's nothing that can be done, I must join Dignity in Dying and campaign for a change in the law? Oh, well, the simple answer, they were by, I think they were in a hospice, actually, not a hospital. Um, and I certainly tried to comfort them, um, but it was pretty inadequate. I certainly uh, uh, spent a lot of time with the family, uh, who were greatly distressed. Um, but, you know, they, they, what's really interesting about this discussion is, that this is, I think, the disconnect between theory and practice. I've often been invited in the last couple of years by church groups um, you know, to speak about this, and many of them have raised the sort of objections um, that, that you've raised, which is fair enough. And then at the end of it, and, and it's quite clear that I'm sort of losing the argument, so to speak, uh, and then at the very end, I sort of say to them, okay, this has happened two or three times, and now, all right, fair enough. Um, you, 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 but let me just ask you one final question I say to the audience. Um, if it was you, if it was you personally suffering with whatever it is, motor neuron, multiple sclerosis, and you were dying in pain, would you like that option of assisted death for yourself? And, you know, every time, every single hand in the room goes up. So I think that's what it's about. It's just giving people the option. It's not for everybody, it's certainly not for you, but I think it is appropriate to give people that option if they are dying in pain. End of Jonathan, story. when I'm late for the airport, I wish that I could drive at 100 miles an hour to get there in time. I'd want that option for myself, but I don't take it because I know that pushing my autonomy would impact on the safety of so many others. It's a nice reply, but it's not relevant. Really? No. Cha you know, many people who are in who are, uh, suffering in the end of life or at any time of life think, yeah, it would be nice. And actually, uh, you know, that might be something I would take. But so many, but so many get to that point later and they think, actually, I'm so glad I didn't take that option when they have had the good palliative care that's on offer. Let's not forget that 320 people die every day, I think it is, without good access to palliative care. You know, I, I'm really glad that you've said how wonderful it can be, but we've hardly scratched the surface of what good palliative care could offer across this country. And so many of the people who you will campaign for you, whose stories you'll use, they've had bad deaths in their family. That's not because palliative care can't help, it's because it wasn't available to them. Well, you know, it's a clear difference that, you know, Mark doesn't want to give people that option, that choice, that right, and I do. Um, so we're not going to agree on this because uh, you want to close down options, I want to open them up. And by the way, um, uh, what's really interesting about Oregon is that the palliative care um, uh, carers uh, who were against assisted dying when it was first introduced, uh, now not only are on board, they work hand in hand um, uh, with Oregon. And, and of course, the whole issue of end of life care has had enormous publicity as a result. And actually the level of investment in palliative care was shot up as a result. So actually, it's not a matter of either or, um, it's a matter of both and, and there's no reason why we can't uh, give people the option of assisted dying for those who wish, but also um, um, uh, raise the level of palliative care 
for those who want to carry on to their last moment. I think they should go together. Where is the data for that, Jonathan? I've not seen any data about investment in palliative care going up. Yes, publicity may go up, but at the end of the day, um, you, I don't think there's any reason why investment in palliative care should go up because palliative care is there to deal with the problems that, that can't be helped otherwise. And you're, you're, you're taking the head off it by basically saying, look, we don't need to invest in further palliative care research. There are these people we can't help. Let's just give them um, assisted suicide. I'd love to see actual data on where that investment has gone up as a result of law change and been sustained. It's very clear we're talking about a limited number of people. I mean, if you want data, I think the, the latest figure for people in Oregon who opt for assisted uh, dying is 0.69%, 0.69% of all deaths in Oregon. So it's less than 1%. So we're really talking about a limited number of people. And most people will want to carry on, struggle on um, to the, to the, to the last moment. And, you know, that's, those are the people we should be helping as well, just as much. And it has risen steadily year on year in Oregon, as you know, but you still haven't given me any data or places to find data about further investment in palliative care, and I'd really like oh, to yeah, see well, that. Well, sorry, um, I didn't mean to miss that out. If you ring up Dignity in Dying, um, uh, they will give it to you. I mean, I'm, I don't have that at my, uh, my hand. Um, and you're certainly right, the number of people have gone up in, of deaths in Oregon, but from a very low base. And in 2019, which is the only figure in my head, it was 191 people. So we're talking about astonishingly low numbers. One, one unbelievable listener, Sebastian Melmoth, got in touch with me just ahead of this discussion and afforded me an article, came out last week, I think, in The Spectator by Joel Zivot, questioning whether assisted dying is in fact as painless or dignified as, as those in favour it make out. Um, the article points out that the same chemicals are often used in death penalty executions and he brings up the case of one particular person um, who was executed in America with a chemical called pentobarbital which caused his pulmonary oedema I may be mispronouncing this um, uh, Mark, edema uh, edema uh, in Oregon four in five assisted suicides have employed pentobarbital or its close relatives um, if a post-mortem examination were to be performed on a body after assisted suicides it's very likely that similar pulmonary edema would be found basically the lungs fill with fluid they drown um, and and it doesn't look it looks peaceful on the surface because the person can't physically show any sign of distress but their 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 point was actually uh when you when these uh, post mortems would be done on execution um ex people have been executed there obviously was a lot of pain and distress involved in that that are you satisfied jonathan that this is actually a dignified way of dying well um, first time i've ever heard that um i've spoken to a number of people who've taken their husband or wife to dignitas um, in Switzerland, and no one's ever reported um, either distress at the time of death um, or any problems uh, with the post-mortem results afterwards. So that's just like, well, where did that come from? So, okay. no. And, uh, and as frankly, I say, if this, it did, this if came in... If that was true, there would be a major outcry. Well, there was a, a major outcry, actually, because it was in The Spectator last week, and uh, Jackie Davis, the chair of HPAD, was debating Joel Zivert on The Spectator podcast. So well worth having a look at that. I think it's actually a really good question to have raised because you know, we don't have, to my mind, good data. And why would you do a post-mortem on people who've had an assisted suicide? You don't need to know the cause of death. They've killed themselves. But um, I think there are really legitimate questions there. Now, of course, in, in Oregon and in you know, proposed in the UK, there'd be oral taking of those medications. That's a different mechanism to intravenous and um, some of it may be to do with the intravenous route, but I think if you, you know, look at a place like Canada, where again they use similar drug combinations, and actually Canada, where you've got the option of both oral and intravenous, hardly any are oral because people realise that it takes longer, there are more side effects or more visible side effects. Very often people who start with an oral um, assisted suicide in Canada, they will convert it to intravenous. There are even flowcharts by the Canadian um, Association of Medical uh, Made provider, Assessors and Providers to say, look, if you're going to go oral, put in an intravenous line just in case you need to convert it to, to intravenous. 
and then in those situations and the vast majority of Canadian deaths I think there is a very strong correlation with the situation that we see in illegal execution in the States using similar drugs in a similar intravenous way and as you've said you know are they simply paralyzed and unable to show uh, the the distress that they show I think it's a really interesting question and you know it's not for us who have concerns to demonstrate the safety of it it's for Jonathan and his colleagues to demonstrate that they've been through all of this and the very fact that Jonathan's never even heard of that I think is is very significant we'll, we'll come back to and allow you to respond to that in just a moment's time Jonathan we're going to go to our final break and and uh, give you a chance to think about that um while while we're on the break uh, we're talking about assisted dying should people of faith support it in favor of that rabbi jonathan remain joins me from the religious alliance for dignity in dying opposing this change dr mark pickering of the christian medical fellowship and we'll be back in just a moment in the united kingdom just today we passed a hundred thousand people who've been killed by the virus i'm not the one here who is claiming that this is being supervised that somebody is watching this somebody knows that this is occurring and somebody's allowing it to occur we're in no position to say definitively there is no morally justifiable reason for this particular evil because we need a godlike perspective on all of space and all of time in order to make that claim Concluding our discussion today on uh, assisted dying and whether people of faith should support it. I've been um, with Rabbi Jonathan Romain and Dr. Mark Pickering on the show today. Um, there is links from today's program to Dignity in Dying and the Religious Alliance there. Uh, you can find them at dignityindying.org.uk forward slash religious alliance. Uh, that's the group that Rabbi Jonathan Romain chairs. Um, Christian Medical Fellowship is at cmf.org.uk and I'm sure you'll be able to find your way to links on their thoughts on assisted dying as well. Um, but just in that last section, um, Mark was outlining some of his concerns that were shared in this Spectator article that was mentioned by Joel Zivert, in which he claims that actually there are, you know, potentially it's not it's not a painless way to go uh, and there's not as much dignity involved because of the association there is with these chemicals that are used also in lethal executions and so on in the in the US. Um, I mean, I know you haven't had a chance, obviously, to, to look at this article yourself at this moment, uh, Jonathan. But what's, I guess this does raise significant questions about the way that we do this, you know, the practical effects of this. And, and um, I, I think in the end, I think what Mark hinted at very early on in the show was when you're at the coalface of doing this stuff and actually administering the drugs and, and those actual crucial end of life decisions, when you're not simply saying yes in, in a sort of neutral environment, it sometimes feels different. Does that make sense? And and um, it doesn't. It's not as simple a question because there's that thing of do I really want my last memories of my loved one to be me force feeding them this you know cocktail of barbiturates to end their life? People don't think that far ahead, I suppose, when they're at that moment and and so on. So, any thoughts on that as 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 to how we, if you are in favour of people being able to do that, that it isn't a distressing way in which to end someone's life in the end uh, well okay firstly i'm very much at, at, at the coalface as a congregational minister of religion whether it's visiting people in hospitals hospices uh, or seeing them dying at home and also counseling their, their family so i really do know what life and death and dying and dead bodies is about which is why i take the attitude that people should have that right to choose for themselves um, also, I mean, the phrase you used, and I, I know you just threw it out, is so totally wrong when you said force feeding their relatives with barbiturates. The whole point about assisted dying is that you do it yourself. And assisted dying doesn't mean that somebody else um, uh, gives you an injection or, or, or gives you the pill. You get the prescription uh, from your GP and then take it to your chemist and then get it. Um, so the assistance is only in the state or the medical um, system will allow you to do it and give you me. But you're the one that has to actually do it. You're the one that has to take the pill in your hand and swallow it um, with a glass of water or whatever. So it's not somebody else, a doctor or a relative, doing it to you uh, 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 at all. So that's a very, very false image. Um, and I'm not sure it is, Jonathan, because people in Oregon talk about having to mix up a hundred pills 
into this horrible syrupy paste and, and yes help their relative take it not force feed them but it's not a simple pill you know that this idea that there's one pill that you take and you slip away is just false well i'm not sure if that's true to be honest um i mean i haven't actually been in the room i don't know have you uh, no no but i've read the reports from people and relatives who had well the answer well you know and, and i can quote you plenty of examples where the if the person slipped gently away. I think if one, if you have a concern, which is fair enough, then the answer is to get involved in the legislation and say, well, look, if this is going to happen, this should happen in this way and not that way, and we should be aware. And that's a good point, you know. And, um, uh, you know, we should be aware that uh, at every stage, what happens is in the best interest of the person concerned and in the best possible way. So they do have, and that's the whole point of an assisted dying, they do have a gentle and peaceful death. That's what we want for all our, for everybody. We are drawing to a close. So I, I'm, I'm going to ask you both to sort of make your, your final uh, thoughts uh, on this. Um, uh, perhaps we'll, we'll start with you, Jonathan, and then Mark, just to give us a sense of why you believe, and there's lots of people who listen, both religious and non-religious, to The Unbelievable Show, but, but specifically why you think that, you know, people of faith should not be concerned, in your case, Jonathan, with this particular legislation coming through the UK Parliament? And then, Mark, your, your final thoughts as well. Yes, assisted dying is not for everyone, and, and I'm not even sure if I would want it for myself. But I do know that I want people and myself to have that option, so that if they were facing the very last uh, weeks or months of their, de of, of their life, and they were in incredible distress, pain, uh, however it's defined, um, then... Uh, I would want them to have that right to, to gently slip away. And I wouldn't want to force them to live on in pain and in distress. And, and I say that as a human being, but also as a person of faith, with everything that um, faith means to me, means that I should assist someone, uh, in other words, give them that permission to do so, uh, if they so wish, and if they are terminally ill and mentally competent. It seems to me a religious response to give people that option, provided uh, that they are the right safeguards uh, to protect them and their families and, and that's what the, uh, all the clauses of the bill uh, are all about. Thank you Jonathan for, for being part of the show today. Mark, your, your final thoughts. Thanks very much and thank you Jonathan for, for engaging with a really good discussion I really appreciate that. I, I think my, my point would be yes compassion, we're all for compassion, we're all for being with suffering people, for helping them, for assisting the dying in different ways. That is what palliative care does. That is why Cicely Saunders, a Christian, who you know, launched the, um, the palliative care movement, did it because she saw people who were not well served and she thought there is a better way. I'm so glad that she didn't uh, give in to the Council of Hopelessness and Despair and just say maybe we should legalise assisted suicide. But there's so much more that needs to be done. I talked about 320 people, I think it's a day, dying without good palliative care. It may be a week, but it's a lot. And um, there's so much more that we can do. The NHS needs good funding for that as well. Um, because at the end of the day, we are crossing a massive line by legalising this. There, there is one massive safeguard against the, the dangers that we've talked about, and it is the current law. The prohibition against killing is the safeguard. As soon as you start to chip away at that and say, well, a little bit of this, six months here, mentally competent here, you, you, you are, um, I don't like the term slippery slope, but you have pushed yourself off that ledge and you, it is very hard to stop it. Like I said, five organisations in the UK and our Crown Dependencies are campaigning to go further than dignity in dying is. So there's no way that that's going to be stopped. It hasn't been stopped in other countries as well. Maybe I could just finish by quoting um, the late Chief Rabbi Lord Sachs, very eloquent opponent of assisted suicide. And he said this in 2006, it is the physician's responsibility to heal not harm, even if the patient requests it. Despite Judaism's strong emphasis on human choice, free will and personal responsibility, we believe there are certain things we may not do, even out of great compassion. And I think if we fail to heed his words, we will be uh, in a very sticky situation, as they are right now in Canada.
we'll leave it there but thank you very much um for both of your engagements and for um the way you've uh, yeah carried out today's discussion on these important issues again links to both uh the religious alliance in dignity and dying uh, that rabbi jonathan remain chairs and mark pickering's christian Me- medical fellowship as well and some of their resources from today's show but for now jonathan and mark thanks for being with me for more conversations between christians and skeptics subscribe to the unbelievable podcast And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter.